Okay, if you want to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, we're going to finish out chapter 2 and head into chapter 3 today. So while you're turning there, I want to thank Martel for doing an amazing job with our communion message today and uh, sharing your heart with us. And I really, really appreciate that. I appreciate your thoughts. I appreciate the idea of a miracle month and how God is working when we don't see him working. So thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we are going to today uh, move on into closing out the first part of the Gospel of John. And on Wednesday, together, we will start the second half of John. First, primarily, the first half of First John has been about Jesus, although there are many other themes there, including what we'll see today. And then the second half is going to be more about love. He turns the corner talking about Jesus and talks about love. But I think one of the things that you'll see from even today's passage is that John is a very, very practical letter. Uh, it's what's known in, uh, I guess, New Testament scholarship as a, a letter of circumstance, writing to a particular situation or a situational letter. So there were things that were going on in the community to whom he was writing, and he addresses those situations. And that makes the letter very practical. Uh, and so um, today's section is no different than that. Uh, I, I'm entitling the lesson today, uh, Five Reasons, but specifically it's five reasons to stay away from sin. And more specifically, you know, there were a couple of week, uh, Wednesdays ago where uh, I, I taught and uh, Phil and Iris, I asked them to do the prayer to open up the, the lesson. And Phil, in his prayer, said, Dear God, thank you for saving me from stinking sin. And I thought, yeah, I, I laughed actually too <laughs> when I heard that. And I was like, ah, that's awesome. And then Iris uh, prayed after that, and she said, Dear God, they, thank you for rescuing us for 32 years. And then in the middle of, of the prayer, Phil was like 33. <laughs> And I laughed at that. I thought that was very cool as well. Uh, but all of us appreciate Phil and Iris so much and how they've devoted their hearts and their lives to following Jesus and really grateful for uh, the fact that God rescued them. But I, and, and looking at their lives, I think one of the reasons that they live such an abundant and giving life in Christ is they know what they've been rescued from. And they, if, when you talk to them, they talk about that quite often. And, uh, you know, whether it's specifically stinking sin or something else, they recognize that. And this is what John is getting at here in, in this part of his letter, is that uh, you need to realize what God has rescued you from and what God has rescued you for. And if you get those things together, then you have great motivation to live the life that God wants us to live. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in this uh, section today. So um, I, I want to just give, a, a, I, I know Phil and Iris, they're back there teaching. They're back there serving right now. But I want to give them a shout out and actually dedicate the lesson to them. And especially to Phil helping me uh, frame the lesson with this idea of five reasons to stay away from stinking sin. That's what we're going to be talking about. But let's start in verse 29. I'm going to read it. And then in the middle of this uh, section here, or rather the second half of it, really deals with these reasons to stay away from sin. Verse 29, this will probably read differently than whatever you're looking at, but uh, that's okay, it, it'll be close enough. If you know that he is righteous, you also know that everyone who practices what is right is born of him. Talking about Jesus there. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And this is what we are. Because of this, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Dear friends, we are now children of God. But it has not yet been known what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, and we will see him just as he is. All of us have this hope in him, uh, that, and we purify ourselves just as he is pure. So it's really focusing quite much on Jesus right there. But then... John gets very practical about sin. 
Everyone who sins breaks the law. That's verse 4. Sin is lawlessness. This is one of the places in the New Testament where you find sin defined. Uh, James defines sin in a different way, but here John defines sin as just sin is no law, basically. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away our sins. There is no sin in him. Everyone who lives, lives in him does not practice sin. No one who continues to sin has seen him or known him. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. From the beginning, the devil has been sinning. This is the reason the Son of God appeared, that he might destroy the work of the devil. Everyone who has been born of God does not continue to sin, because God's seed remains in that person. They are not able to sin, because they have been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are made obvious. Those who do not do what is right are not God's children. Those who do not love their brothers and sisters are not God's children. And that is a great segue to what he's going to be talking about next, and that is love. And so it's a beautiful transitional phrase right there to go into what we'll be talking about on Wednesday night, loving God and loving our brothers and sisters, which begins the second half of the book. But let's today talk about these five reasons for staying away from sin. Okay, we're just going to go down through these, and I think yeah, I listed all five of them right there. You know, we don't have to go through all of them specifically because we're going to go through each one of them. But if you want to take a picture of that and carry that with you, uh, then you're welcome to do that. Five reasons to not choose sin. Five reasons to stay away from sin. Number one, the first reason we stay away from sin is sin is lawlessness, and this is found in verse 4, which reads, everyone who is doing sin also does not do the law, is lawless, and sin is lawlessness. In the Greek, that is one word, and it literally is a namas, which is against law, or no law. So sin is no law. That's what John is saying here, and therefore, one reason to stay away from sin is it creates chaos. That's what, it, that's what John is saying. Sin is chaotic, and sin creates chaos. It'll create chaos in the world around us. It'll cre create chaos in our lives. We need some stability. We need some boundaries. We need some guardrails in life. Because if we don't have guardrails, then we're going to end up crashing. And so what what the law of God does and what um, God himself does is provide those guardrails for us. This is a positive way of looking at the law. Sometimes when we look at the law, we look at it as negative. But the Bible doesn't present the law in that way. It presents the law as a protector, as a safety net, as a guardrail to life to keep us from chaos. And this is how John sees sin and sees lawlessness and also sees the law. A couple of weeks ago, I was in San Antonio, Texas, uh, at a conference there, and I had a meeting that I needed to, to be at, and a uh, brother picked me up, and uh, we were uh, running a little late, and it was totally my fault. Uh, the, the clock in the room said one time, and I never looked at my watch, and I never looked at my phone, and I thought I had more time than I did, and I was downstairs, and I was grabbing breakfast, and he comes walking in, and he says, you ready to go? <laughs> I'm like, um, yeah, I will be after breakfast. He says, you don't have time. We're, we're running a little late. And so I was like, I, then I looked at my watch. And I said, oh, wow. Yeah, we are. And so I uh, grabbed some yogurt or something and headed out the door. And um, we are on our way to get to this meeting. And he stops at, uh, you know that sign right there, right? No turn on red. And the light was red. And so he looks over at me and he says, Steve, I have a question for you. <laughs> and I said, okay, what is your question? He said, are you a rule keeper or a rule breaker? <laughs> and I knew what he was asking. He was asking, should I turn right on red? And uh, I, I, I just looked over back at him and I said, well, you know what? I'm a Christian. 
so I'm a rule keeper. And you're a Christian too. And so I'm going to help you with this, okay? I'm going to help you right now. And we're not going to turn right on red. And he was like, ah, huh, okay, all right. He said, I'm a bit more of a rule breaker than you are, obviously. But, and he just sighed. He just sighed about it. Huh. <laughs> and so we wait for the light to change, which wasn't that much time. And then he turned right on red, and he sped the whole way. He didn't, didn't pay attention to the speed limit at all, all the rest of the way. And I'm like, oh, you obviously didn't get the point of what I was saying here. Um, but as, as disciples of Jesus, we must lean toward being rule keepers, especially when it comes to the law of God. I mean, the law of God is there for a reason. And it's not there to be a burden to us. It's there to actually help us and to protect us and to be a safety net and to be a guardrail. Because without law, chaos ensues. This is true of society and it's true of individual life. You know, the story of addiction is the story basically of breaking rules. At first, people who enter an addiction, they believe they are in control of their drug of choice. Then they overstep a little bit. And then they, even after they overstep a little bit or overstep a lot, they still believe they are in control until the overstepping catches up with them. And then the first step to being healed is having to admit, I have a problem. And this is the nature of sin. This is one reason to stay away from sin, because on the other side of sin is chaos. And the other side of sin is a lack of control and a loss of self-control and addiction and ultimately being ruled by that sin, because that's the nature of sin. Sin doesn't just exist in your life in a, in a, in a kind of a, a, a you know, a, a partnership like, oh, you're, you can have, you can control it part of the time, I'll control it. No, sin wants to control all the time. That's the nature of sin. And so John is trying to help us out here that sin is lawlessness. It is the arena of no law. And we actually do need boundaries in life. And if you've, ever been, if you've ever driven down a twisty, windy road, they put guardrails there, especially if there's a drop-off. And the guardrails are there for a reason, to protect us if we happen to get out of control. And that's what the law does. Later in 1 John, this is a great verse in 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, John says this, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commands. And then he says this beautiful phrase that says, and his commands are not burdensome. That's John's view of the law. That's John's view of the commands of God. They didn't put them in our lives to be a burden to us. In fact, he put them in our lives to lighten the burden. He put them in our lives so that we wouldn't have to walk off the edge of the cliff to experience that. We see the edge and we back up. And that's the nature of the law of God. So that's one reason to stay away from sin. Now, number two, the second reason to stay away from sin. And you'll see it right here. There is no sin in Jesus. If we're trying to follow Jesus, then we stay away from sin because that's what Jesus did. And we want to live a life like Jesus. And so it says here in verse 5, and we know that the one, that's Jesus, appeared, another way of saying that, was manifest or was revealed, in order that he might take away sin. And then he gives this great declaration right here, and sin is not present in him. So Jesus did not sin. He lived his life on the earth, and according to the Hebrew writer, he was tempted in all ways like as we are, but without sin. He never chose the wrong choice. He always made the right choice. And notice it says sin is not present in him, which makes me wonder if we live a life in sin, are we present with Jesus? And I think we need to ask ourselves that question. But here we see that Jesus made, in his life he made the choice, I am going to live in obedience to the law and I am going to say no to sin. And that's the life that he lived. 
And so when Jesus came into the world, it actually says he came into the world to, to get us away from sin because there's no sin in Jesus. And you know, it seems that in every section of his letter, John says something about Jesus. This will be true in the second half of the letter as well. You could tell when, when John writes his letter, he is really close to Jesus. He's never far from Jesus. And I think that's why, one of the reasons why John can write this section with such confidence, because he knows he lives in Jesus. And by keeping Jesus in his mind, it helps him stay away from sin. And that's what he's inviting us to do. Think of the sinless one. Think of the one who always made the right choice. Think of the one who not only stayed away from chaos, but wants to make peace out of chaos. Even in our lives, think of Jesus and keep Jesus in front of us all the time. Okay, number, number three, the third reason. The third reason we stay away from sin is because we are remaining in Jesus. Because we remain in Jesus. And this is the way John says it. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. <clears throat> That's a very direct statement that he makes. If you're, going to, if you're going to be in Jesus, then you, you choose not to sin. You choose righteousness over sin. You make right decisions. And then he says, everyone who sins has not seen him or know him, known him. And so if you do choose to sin, then basically what you're doing is you're messing up your eyesight and you're messing up your cognition. Okay, you're messing up the way that you think, the way that you know things, and the way that you see things when you choose sin. When you choose Jesus, what happens is you help your cognition, you help your knowledge, you help the way that you think, you help the way that you know, and it straightens out your spiritual eyesight. And again, this is much like John wrote before, uh, Jesus is without sin, so stick with him. If you stick with him and remain in him and think about him, it's going to straighten up your eyesight. Spiritually, you're going to see better. So this is a reason to stay away from sin. It messes up our spiritual eyesight. Karen Jobes, in her book, she writes this, The one who has not seen him is still blind and in the dark. Even those who think they see and know God have not truly seen or known him if they continue to live with sin in their lives. They lack the vision and knowledge of Jesus, who he is, and what he came to do. I really like that statement there, and it basically is saying what John said. If you think about Jesus and you focus on Jesus, if you really see and know him, then that's going to help you in your spiritual life. So remain in Jesus. Think about Jesus. And I've talked about it a few weeks ago, but there are, there are three main things that I do personally to think about Jesus throughout the day. And I'll just share these with you very quickly. One is... I sing songs about Jesus, and I keep, I keep Jesus in my heart and in my mind by just singing about him, and I have all these songs and a whole list that just come up all the time, and um, they help me. They help me to focus on Jesus. Another thing that I do is I memorize the words of Jesus, and I keep the words of Jesus on my heart, keep the words of Jesus on my tongue. And I try to talk about Jesus and actually repeat the words of Jesus throughout the day. That helps me focus on Jesus. And then the third thing I do is I, I meditate on Jesus. I mean, I, when I sit down or even when I'm going on my walks, which I do constantly, I focus on Jesus and think about Jesus. I talk to Jesus when I'm on my walks. Um, but even more than that, my prayers these days are often what I call wordless prayers. I pray, but I don't use words. I pray and I just think. And I think about Jesus and I contemplate Jesus. And I hold on to him and I ask him to hold on to me. Something that helps me with that is journaling. As I get into journaling, I constantly am writing about Jesus in my journals. That's what helps me. Now my question is, what helps you? What allows you to focus more on Jesus? You need to find those things in your life, and you need to cling to those things. Why? It's going to help your spiritual eyesight. You're going to see everything else better if you do that um, by thinking about Jesus. 
You know, one of the songs that I sing sometimes that just pops into my, my, my brain is um, because I learned this when I was a, a little kid growing up in church. And um, it's called Have a Little Talk with Jesus. And I don't know if you know that song. We don't really sing it here, so you might not know it at all. Or you might have learned it earlier in your life. Um, but there's one, there's especially one sentence that I love. And also in the song itself, there's this bass line that goes, Oh, let us, like, <laughs> and, then, and then everybody else goes, have a little talk with Jesus, let us, and when I was a little kid, uh, you want to sing it with me, is that good, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, uh, maybe, um, when I was a kid, like five or six years old, we were singing this in church, and you know, I thought I had the most booming and awesome bass voice of anyone there. And, of course, it was really a, a, a high treble. It was a, probably more alto than bass. Um, and, and, but I would, I, would, I would just sing out so loud on Lutus, <laughs> thinking that I was sounding like Johnny Cash or somebody like that. Um, and so I remember that, but I still remember the song today. And here is the verse that, that really uh, helps me. They're, they're actually all, all really good. Um, it says, I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by it. So when you have a little prayerful yearning, and your heart to the heaven is turning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It makes it right. <laughs> yeah. Now we need to work on our country twang, okay? Because when I sang it growing up in the church, it was, it was very, very country. Uh, we'll work on that next week. Uh, but that helps me. I don't know if it helps you or not, but it helps me that I, I think about talking to Jesus. And I sing the song, and then I start talking. And um, that helps my spiritual vision, helps me to stay away from sin. Number four. Number four is... Be like Jesus and not like the devil. John's very practical here. He's very practical. He just sets up a, 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 basically a converse here, a contrast here. He says, Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous, meaning Jesus. The one who practices sin is of the devil. From the beginning, the devil has been sinning. This is the reason the Son of God appeared, that he might destroy the work of the devil. I mean, that's just straightforward. That's just telling it like it is. That's just saying, you know, if you, if you decide to live in stinking sin, you're going to smell like Satan because that's what Satan's nature is. That's just who he is. So make a choice to choose righteousness because Jesus is righteous. Don't choose sin because that's of the devil. And at some point, you, you can't win that battle on your own you're going to need to go to Jesus. So stay with Jesus. Stick with Jesus. Don't choose sin. And I appreciate the fact that John is just so forthright there. Um, very, very practical and very straightforward in what he has to say. I like to think, and I have this little trajectory of, of righteousness here that I drew up next. Uh, this has to do with making right choices here. Uh, trajectory of righteousness. And I know, again, those of you who are graphic artists, you're, um, you're wowed and amazed at my graphic arts uh, capability, graphic art capabilities here. But yes, I drew that myself, okay? Uh, yes. Uh, but this trajectory of righteousness, we make this choice that goes both vertical and it goes horizontal. And every time we choose righteousness, that's a great choice because that's, that's a Jesus choice. That's what Jesus did. And so when we choose righteousness, vertically we're saying, God, I'm with you. Jesus, I'm on your team. I want you in my life, and I want to be with you, and I want to have that relationship with you. So you know what? There's stinking sin. I'm going to say no to that. 
There's righteousness right there. I'm going to say yes to that because I'm choosing God. I'm on team Jesus, and the Holy Spirit lives in me. That's the next point. And so I am going to stick with God here, and we get that, that great vertical going on. But then what that vertical does is it causes the horizontal to happen around us. And the horizontal is we live in community with other people that are saying yes to God and saying, yes, I'm on team Jesus. And we help each other out and we encourage each other and we're in each other's lives. And so there's us and others and others and us and we're all together in this. And that's the horizontal. That's us reaching out our arms um, right and left and pulling everybody together and say, let's help each other do this. We are in this battle together. We're going to fight this fight together. And we're, let's choose God. Let's choose Team Jesus. And let's be in this together. And that is this trajectory of righteousness that John wants us to choose. And anytime we choose Satan, anytime we choose sin, then it messes all that up. All of that needs to be recalibrated again. Because sin gets in, and it impacts our relationship with God. It impacts the vertical, but you know what else happens? It impacts the horizontal. We start pulling away from people, and we're not as close as we used to be. And also, we don't encourage people the way that we once encouraged them because we hold back because that sin is there. And so we, get, you know, we, we make these choices that connect us to God and connect us to each other, and those are righteous choices. And then number five. We'll end up with this. Point number five is God's seed is in you. So we stay away from sin because we've been born of God. He talks about that. And the seed of God remains in us. So verse 9, everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. And that person is not able to sin because that person has been born of God. I mean, there's an interesting phrase right here that uh, we can spend a lot of time talking about. We don't have that time, but it, it does, you know, we, we can think about it. And that is the phrase, and that person is not able to sin. Because even in other parts of his, his um, letter here, John talks about if you say you do not have sin, you're a liar. Truth isn't in you. So you have that statement there, and then you have the statement, sin is not in this person. This is what happens with the Bible quite often, and this is why we study the Bible and study the Bible together. Because sometimes we have these statements that appear to just contradict each other, like those two statements, and we have to reconcile them. Because on, you know, just face value, they, they can't both be right at the same time. And so that's why it's so important when you study the Bible to look at context, to look at the context of the verse. Because actually, both of those verses are right in the right context. If you're, if you're in the context where you're um, just saying, you know, I, if you're in the context where you're acting like you're living the life, which was the first context that John talks about, and you're not, then John says, you know what, you're acting like you don't sin, but you do. Anybody who says they don't sin, they're lying. So get real with yourself. Sin you really think that you're that good, that you never make a mistake, that you never, um, you know, just make the wrong choice, choose the wrong thing? John says, get real. But here he's trying to say something different. He's trying to help us to see that we can and should fight this battle of sin, and if we do it right with God, we'll start changing, and we'll start growing, and we'll become more spiritual people. And we can actually get to the point that most of the time when sin comes around, you know what we're going to do? We're going to say, no, stinking sin, I am not choosing you because you're going to ruin everything. I know you, I know what you do, and you're going to ruin everything. And I don't want that anymore. And I'm choosing God here, and I'm choosing Jesus here. And that's what he's talking about here. Let the seed of God, let God remain in you. God's seed might be his word, or it might be the Holy Spirit, and you have to make a choice with that too. That's part of Bible study, is making those choices, because John isn't specific here. But I, I think both are good, okay? <laughs> you, can't, you can't do wrong with either of those choices. Get the Word of God in you, and let the seed of God remain in your heart. Or get the Holy Spirit in you, 
and let the seed of God remain in you through the Holy Spirit. Both of those things are good. The point is, is let God remain and say no to sin. And then all of a sudden, what will happen is, you, we talked about it um, two points ago, this spiritual eyesight will start getting more 2020. And you'll start seeing things more clearly. And you'll start making the right choices. And then when the opportunity, and, and it happens every day, the opportunity comes to make the wrong choice, all of a sudden you start saying, nope. I am not going to make that wrong choice because that invites chaos into my life. And I don't want chaos. I want God. I want Jesus. I want to live with Jesus. So we overcome sin by making these choices, keeping the seed of God in us, and we start growing. And ultimately, that's the whole point of what tri of John is trying to do in this section right here. He's trying to help us to grow spiritually. And he's so practical. I really appreciate John being so practical that he says, if you're going to grow spiritually, one of the things that you're going to have to think about is sin. And you're going to have to deal with it in your life. And you're going to have to make some solid decisions saying, nope, stinking sin, stay away from me. Righteousness, Jesus, God, yes. I want to make those choices. So, this is what John is helping us out with right here. In summary, we have these five things that help us, these five reasons for us to stay away from stinking sin. What I invite you to do this week is to take a look at your life and just make the right decisions. Choose God, choose Jesus, and thereby you'll start choosing to love one another more deeply, which is where we're going to go on Wednesday night. Thank you.